Washington football. Woo! Oops, my Hello, bad. Right. everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. <laughs> the Burgundy Zone. And Michael of- Reed. Don't forget the other one. Right. And the Burgundy Zone. Is that of- Logies? It is. Where are you? Saint, You're in San Francisco Saint Logies? right now? I'm in, I'm in San Fran, dog. I'm with your boy Kyle Shanahan. Where are you at? <laughs> That's a sick background, bro. Thanks, fam. Yeah. No, no, I did it for you. I know Monday he was in space. <laughs> now he's in San Francisco. Who knows where Reed winds a, up on what Monday? What a life to live. Right. Where That's in the true, world true. is Reedy San Diego? That's right. what I always say. <laughs> but the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listenfrederick.com. Obviously, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you again, Logan. You're more busy than anybody in the world right now, it would seem. But the ep- the title of this episode is called Boot Camp. Because mm. it seems like OTAs is almost reminiscent of a boot camp video you see of drill sergeants yelling at uh, um, prospects coming in with Eric B. Enemy. What what has OTAs been like for you, sir? Um, I mean, in terms of me watching, I think it's been um, it's it's different. It's different than any uh, kind of OTA that I've seen before, in the sense that uh, they do a lot. They have a very limited number of team reps in practice it's like between 15 and 20 reps of team that means you know offensive defensive line linebackers running backs everybody all 11s on the field together right um instead they've kind of shifted some of those team periods which are traditionally part of otas and kind of moved instead towards seven on seven and like skelly periods so physically i think the kind of impacts are probably way down in this context you know so physically on the body probably feels a little bit better but they are running the receivers the, the tight ends the running backs are running a lot of routes. They're getting a lot of volume on the legs. So I do think that's going to be tough. But, you know, to your point in terms of the boot camp kind of feel, I think EB has done a um, has done a really nice job of just being detailed over the first two days. You know, I was out of practice yesterday, and just to see him watching, you know, routes on air, him standing in front of the receivers and being like, get your depth, you're a yard short. And just every – not like, you know, it wasn't just Terry, it wasn't just Shahan. It was literally every single person in line you know, that got coached up. And I, I think that that's the right way to do it. And, I, you know, after every ball in, in Skelly, which is basically four on four, you know, the tight ends, uh, running backs versus linebackers and safeties, um, you know, he comes back and he's coaching the quarterback up. And, you know, not not to take anything away from Scott, but I didn't always see that same level of detail, that same, that same level, level of energy with Scott. So it's definitely um, a little bit different vibe this year with him being there. And, um, you know, I think it's pretty exciting stuff, honestly. Yeah, sounds like he's bringing a, a different level of accountability out there, which is definitely always a good thing. But speaking of you um, watching what you've seen at OTA so far, you got a chance to um, watch OTAs last year as well and whenever they brought in Carson Wentz. Has there been any differences between what you've seen from Wentz like last year compared to what Sam Howell has done so far? I, obviously, it's only been a couple of days and they're not really doing anything because they're not in pads or anything like that. But if any, what differences have you seen? Well, yeah, I think they, they are doing stuff. They are running, you know, offensive stuff. They're working on timing. They're working on routes. They're working on protections in certain situations. And I will say that this feels very, very different from last year, just from like a schematic standpoint. Lots of different personnel groupings, lots of different form- formations, just a different emphasis at this time of year. And, you know, I think, um, you know, the shift in kind of philosophy, like plays into what Sam Howell does really well. You know, he's a guy who played a lot of gun in college. They're in the gun a lot now. And Sam Howell looks very comfortable, quite frankly. It looks looks very, very comfortable on point. I mean, obviously, there's a couple of plays here and there that, you know, I'm sure he'd like to have back. But I think overall, um, look very, very comfortable. And that's something that I think is um, is good. It, it, you know, again, it's been two days. Today was the third day. I haven't watched this practice yet, but I plan on to when I get home. And, you know, he just looks sharp. The ball's coming out of his hands nice. The accuracy has been there. You know, it looks like he's been on time, and that's something that I was a little surprised by, uh, quite honestly, because, you know, I thought he'd be struggling a little bit with the new offense, new terminology. But, you know, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, it's whatever you can take from two days, he looked good. And, um, you know, hopefully he continues to look good and continues to improve. Yeah. Yeah, St. Logie's, you had an excellent Kanye West-level breakdown on why the (laughs) – not mentally, but you know what I mean – on why the offensive line – going to be better under EB. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Let, let some of these boys give, give the hometown fans something to talk about? So, some, some of the boys, eh? Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so basically what I think yeah. like when get you get the boys you, fired up. Get them fired up. So when um I don't know, when I when I watch Kansas City, when I watch the first couple of days of OTAs, I think the thing that sticks out to me is just the understanding that A B has that, you know, pass protection is the hardest thing to do in football outside of playing quarterback. And he does he insulates that group. They're running a lot of play action, they're running a lot of quick game, they're running a lot of screens, they're running a lot of alignments that kind of make the rushers wonder if they're getting shipped. They're really detailed in their protection rules. And I think, um, you know, like when you go back and watch the Super Bowl, like EB and, and Andy Reid and that whole staff in Kansas City understood that they needed to protect that group from that vaunted Philly pass rush. And they did that through play calling. And I think EB understands that um, that to a, to a very high level. And I think you'll see that group play better maybe than the sum of its parts because of that understanding. So that's something that I, you know, I probably was a little worried about going into training camp, just kind of the O-line, the O-line depth. There's some positions on there where there's a lot of new people um, and a lot of young people that, you know, haven't really proven anything yet at those spots. So uh, I was pleasantly surprised over the first couple of days with the level of detail with that group. And then obviously um, the play calling and the sequencing and understanding uh, kind of what you what you have there as a as an offensive play caller. And to elaborate on that, Logan, before I get to my next question for you, Sadiq Charles started at left guard for OTAs. How did he look? Did you take any mental notes? Yeah, I think Sadiq, you know, he's one of these guys that's like a tremendous athlete. Like he was a tremendous athlete coming out of LSU and he's been a tremendous athlete since he's got here. The problem is he just hasn't, you know, had the, uh, you know, hasn't been healthy enough to show you consistently, right? And I think there's a level of inconsistency with his game that has always, always makes me nervous. It's like you see these tremendous splash plays. You're like, wow, if we can get that guy on the right page, he's going to be special. And then he'll kind of five plays later do something like, man, you know, that's a, that's a mental mistake or, or whatever. And I think that's kind of held true. And, it, and it's hard to evaluate it now because he's going against one of the best defensive tackles in football and John Allen every single day. So it's hard to say, oh, like Sadiq's having a good or bad camp. I think Sadiq just needs to be show that he can be a little bit more consistent. The highs have been so high, but the lows have also been very low. And I, and I, I like Sadiq. I think he's a good football player. I like what he could potentially be. But he's got to show you that he can do it. You know, he doesn't need to be hitting home runs. He needs to be getting on base more. And I think um, if he can do that, I think this offensive line will be in re- uh, really good shape. Yeah, and my, he's got I'm, one of the sickest Instagrams in the game, too. Yeah, he does. Sadiq's is it just, is it just the king. A, is it just a picture of his calves or what? No, but they're they're very nice calves. I agree. But <laughs> it's, a lot of them's like him, him dressing all, all all sick. It's all sick with it and stuff, and like posting up against the fridge. It's, just, it's the and, denim and outfit. Like, Reed is a like, sucker for denim. Blessing that up. I, yeah, who's not, dude? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he's always got like a sick Drake song for a caption. It's like hell, yeah, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, so he gets it. Um, but Drake Logan, basically raps in captions. By the way, he does. <laughs> but Logan, I wanted to ask you about the DBs. Um, who was out there uh-huh. starting? Were there any surprises there? But more specifically, Quan Martin and Emmanuel Forbes. How? Did, what were you seeing from those two? Uh, yeah. So let's start. I guess with. Day one, I thought, you know, Emmanuel Forbes played a lot of nickel, which was, was I was a little surprised about because he didn't do that a whole bunch in college. And then the next day, Benjamin St. Juice lined up a little bit more in the nickel. So I think they're kind of working through, you know, kind of cross-training those guys, trying to see who falls and fits best where. Mm. Uh, and that's a good problem to have. you got yeah. three really good cornerbacks and, um, and you know, like you got to find out the best kind of um, sequencing to get those guys in there. So I think uh, that that was kind of a little bit of a surprise. Quan Martins looked excellent. He had a couple um, kind of very tight pass defenses against Logan Thomas and really tight coverage, and he just moves well. He's got these corner coverage skills, but he's got kind of like this little bodybuilder build, you know, so he looks good out there. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that he is probably the biggest piece in that secondary, quite honestly. I know people are fired up about Emmanuel Forbes, but I think his ability to move around and play the post and play the nickel and, and play a little linebacker is going to be really advantageous for this group because it's going to allow you to get your best five or six guys on the field at the same time. So um, I think both those guys look good. Again, it's only two days. And talk about positions that are hard to evaluate at this time of year. Those guys uh, are tough because they're running a whole bunch of new coverage, doing a whole bunch of new stuff. But I think um, just from a movement standpoint, from like a, a feel standpoint, it didn't. I, I felt like instinctively they their eyes were kind of in the right spot. Um, they were matching concepts well, and again, it's still early on, but um, I, I was I was encouraged by what I saw, and, and uh, you know, we'll see. We've got a long way to go until season starts, right. but I think for first two days, first three days of practice, that was pretty good. Right. So, um, a little bit of the the current news in Commanders Nation right now. You, as you being a former player, you've been in a couple different locker rooms. Is it really a big deal when, like, as a player, 
um, whenever guys don't show up to the voluntary voluntary OTAs? Or is it just one of those things where it's like, as long as he comes in, puts in the work, and just does what he's supposed to do when, whenever it counts, like during the season, is just kind of like it is what it is type of thing? I mean, the, the off-season program has changed a little bit since I was playing. You know, the old adage, it's voluntary, mandatory. Like, that's kind of gone by the wayside a little bit here. And so I do think guys are a little bit more understanding when people miss this kind of stuff. Like, before, I mean, no one missed anything, you know? Like, it was just kind of like you were here. And now this has changed. And, I, you know, quite frankly, when I went to the combine and talked to my some of my coaching buddies, like, they acknowledge that it's changed too. So I don't think it's quite the big deal that it used to be. Um, you know, I think with – with some of the guys that are missing, I don't think it's as big a deal with other guys. I think it's a bigger deal just because I think, you know, the, the team kind of said that they wanted that person there and then they're not going to show up. So it's not so much that like I personally, as a player in a locker room, I don't care. You got to handle your business. You got to do what you feel you need to do and, and get paid and handle your career the way you want to handle it. And, and it's not my job or my role or my space to tell you anything different. And I feel the same way now, but I, I kind of say like, if I'm, if I'm ownership, if I'm the general manager, if I'm the head coach, I'm like, man, um, you know, we kind of told him we wanted him here and he's not here. So that's right. something that I think as a player, I'd be like, wow, that's an interesting, interesting decision. But again, I'm not going to care if you come out and have 16 sacks. And, um, you know, quite frankly, right. I think the coaching staff would feel the same way, honestly. Right. Right. St. Logies, you, as Hall just mentioned, you've been in a lot of locker rooms. And this isn't really about even about football, but it's somebody who's been making their podcast around lately. You, you were in the same locker room as Will Compton. Was Will Compton did was what was he like? Is he Will a funny Compton, dude? He seems pretty chill. Will Compton was super funny. I think he's obviously like leaned into that more, but he was a very charismatic guy, good leader. I liked him as a leader, hard worker, overachiever. Um, and I really resonate with that. You know, I like people like that who kind of squeeze every ounce of talent they possibly can out of what God gave them. And he was a guy like that. So I enjoyed hanging out with Will. He's a good guy, and obviously his personality, um, seeing him, seeing what he's doing now is not really a surprise because he is kind of that outgoing, funny guy. But I do think he's 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 matured in that role. He's grown in that role, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty chill. Pretty yeah, chill. it is pretty chill. Logan, to wrap this up, <laughs> only have a couple more questions for you, sir. But yesterday, Washington lost Amari Rodgers, the 6'8 yeah. tight end, former quarterback. A big blow for the tight end group, which is unproven uh, right now. But Cole Turner, the fifth-round draft pick from last season, this is his second year. It's a big year for him. I think this could be a big one for him. What have you seen from the tight ends and more specifically from Cole Turner? Yeah, obviously, it's such a bummer that Armani gets hurt because, you know, he was kind of that athletic, twitched-up freak that was going to, you know, potentially be something really special. He played well in his limited minutes last year. I just, I just feel really bad with people yeah. that are good guys, that work hard, that are, you know, doing things the right way, suffer a setback like setback like this. So, so hopefully, you know, just wish him a speedy recovery and things get going the right way. But in terms of the rest of the guys that are healthy, um, you know, obviously Cole Turner, everyone was talking about him during training camp last year, and he seems to have picked up right where he left off. Mm. with regards to training camp like he's just he catches the football really well he's got a nice suddenness to him he doesn't have the long speed but i think a lot of people you know a lot that it's kind of starting to characterize the position but he does have nice short area quickness and a, an ability to separate at the top of routes and catch the football at a high level and dude's like six seven so that's a kind of a rare combination so he's doing a great job bates has been doing a good job kind of in a little different role than he's exposed to i think they've only been running maybe one or two runs um, per practice in terms of team and seven on seven. And so that's a little bit outside of his comfort zone because that's, you know, what he majors in. So right. he's been running routes. I think he's looked actually pretty good in that department. Logan Thomas, I think, you know, I think when it's all said and done and when he gets really comfortable with this offense, he'll look like, you know, kind of a Travis Kelsey light in this offense. You know what I mean? He'll be the guy getting a lot of touches, probably – 45 to 50 touches, I think. And I think he'll be able to maximize those touches once he settles in a little bit. Um, and then obviously uh, Curtis Hodges is the other guy who's going to benefit from Armani being out. And Curtis has had made some nice plays over the last couple of days. And he's, he's 6'8", he's 250, converted wide receiver, runs pretty well for a guy that size. And, um, you know, has made some nice plays on the football. And I think that group, those four guys, barring something crazy happening, are probably going to be your four guys going into season. And I think after seeing the first three days of OTAs, granted it's three days, it's not a huge sample size, I think they deserve it. I think fans should feel pretty good about it. It just depends on you know, how Logan picks up the offense. Can Cole stay healthy? Can Curtis stay healthy? And then can they find how to use Bates in this offense that's at the moment 
very pass centric. And I think they will. Like when you look at Kansas City's offense, they run the football really well and they got right. guys that do that. So, um, but that's, I think that's a group that I'm excited to see how they gel and develop because I think the potential is, is quite frankly sky high. So, yeah, one other guy that is coming back from injury that is poised for a big, a uh, big year in his second year needing a big year is Fedarian Mathis. Excuse yeah. my ignorance if he's not playing right now based off injury, but how is he moving? Um, you know, it's funny. Big Phil is a, uh, he's out there. He's doing his thing. He's working with the twos mostly, uh, John and Payne, obviously working with the ones. Um, and he shows up. I, I think he's still a little bit raw. You know, he didn't have a ton of opportunity last year to play because of the injury. But I think he's a guy that I, I like his process, at least in the team stuff, right? I don't know how he handles himself an individual. But he's a guy that seems to have a very active motor in the team setting, you know. And I've heard that there's like, you know, that he, he's not like a goof off. But, he, you know, he likes to have fun during individual or whatever. And he's a good guy and everybody likes him. But I, I like the way he kind of grinds in the team setting, or at least he appears to. So I hope he gets healthy. I hope he finds the rotation. Obviously, the other guy inside that – isn't practicing as John Ridgeway. I don't know if it's the peck or the back or whatever he's got going on, but um, he's uh, I can't wait to see those two young guys getting some reps and, and spelling the two, uh, the two war daddies in the middle. Cause I think that's just going to make this defense way better. So. And last one, just briefly, how have the linebackers looked? Obviously Jamin has a little thing going on, so he's not playing at the moment. So we, that, that's a position that everyone wanted more depth in. So now we're seeing that depth in real time. So how did they look through the first two days of OTAs? Um, you know, it's hard to tell because I think there is so much passing in the, in the offense right now. Um, one of the things that's challenging about the linebackers in this offense is they have to take on blocks at a pretty high level. They haven't had to do that right now. I'd say in terms of getting into coverage, Kalik Hudson's look like a, like a little, like Wolverine out there, man. He is fast to the football. He can match backs. He's got great foot speed. He looks way different in my opinion from training camp last year. And Hopefully that confidence that he built during the Dallas game is going to kind of, um, you know, be parlayed into this season. He can have a role within this defense. Cody Barton looks good. Uh, you know, kind of what you'd expect from a guy converted safety, good in coverage, understands spots. Made a play in the ball, I think, the first day. Got his hand in there on a football, so that's nice to see. And then, uh, you know, Mayo's backing up with Eifler or Harris. That You know, their numbers are almost identical. It's like 45 and 46, but – um, you know, that's kind of flushing out and Mayo does a great job. You know, he's a very solid football player, but somewhat limited athletically. And I think, you know, if Kalik is going to be this kind of plus piece or a guy that's developing, I think the depth's actually okay. You know, and I, you know, that's not something I thought I'd be saying um, at this point of the off season, but if he's, if he's where it looks like he's at, um, I think they're going to be okay. And you know, that's a big if, and they got to put pads on and a lot of things have to happen before season starts, but I was pleasantly surprised with the energy that he brought to practice uh, the last couple of days. And Logan, I can't thank you enough for creating some time for us and really helping us out this evening, as always, giving us your thoughts. And, you know, don't let Santana and Fred get to you, man. We'll link up with Coach Curl or Jason Wright. We'll get you hooked up with some Jordans or something to go in there and surprise them one day. <laughs> don't let them get on you about your fashion, okay, Logan? I appreciate it, man. Thanks. I need I need some backup out there. appreciate it. Thanks. Of course. Logan, have a good night, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks. Appreciate you guys it. Too. Later, guys. All right, everybody, we just spoke with the man, Mr. Logan Paulson. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk with the professor, as yeah. always. I mean, like you say, he's been so busy. He's all over TV and the Command Center, YouTube show and stuff like that. So uh, definitely good to get him on. It's been a while. Big takeaway from what he's saying, specifically about OTAs. I know it's a small sample size. I know that how you feel about it because you want to see more games played. But the fact that Sam Howell does seem comfortable to Logan, I think is monumental. Uh, yeah. I mean, no <laughs> um, it actually goes back to, like, what they were saying about Sam Howell last year and, like, in the fact that they said that, like, I mean, going back to college as well, they said he's a guy that's really in his playbook, likes to know the just the, the playbook from front to back and really just deep dives into it. And they were saying that he really picked up Scott Turner's system, like, fairly quickly last year. So the fact that he's picking up EB's system and, like you said, kind of looks comfortable and feels comfortable in the system – or this early on is definitely a, a plus sign right now. And I think it's very telling that it, they are basically only doing pass plays at the moment. I think that's incredibly yes, telling. Sir. It's showing what the coaching staff is telling the team what they need to work on. This is yeah. what we need to harp on is pass pro all day long. And obviously last season on offense, in rushing yards, they were 12th in the NFL with 100 averaging 126 yards on the ground. But 
on the passing wise, they were 21st, averaging 204 yards per game. So obviously the coaching staff is going about this in the right way. Eric Bieniemy running this like a boot camp, which is exactly what it should be. He's not wasting any time lighting a fire under those guys' butts. But speaking of lighting a fire under their butts, let's get into our fan questions before we are joined by our next guest. This one's from the Colonel Hall. He says, I've been meaning to ask how closely our scouting crew monitors leagues like the XFL and USFL. In one week, we've signed both Gerard Jones-Smith and Farrar Gardner. Please comment on realistic expectations for them in D.C. Yeah, um, obviously, there's been a couple guys from the XFL that have uh, gotten looks on various teams. We were one of them, like you mentioned. Um, as far as expectations, look, I feel like I think Gardner was with us last year during training camp and ended up getting cut, and that's why he's in the XFL. So the fact that they brought him back, he's a familiar face. Yep. Um, again, Logan Paulson was just talking about the depth at that linebacker position. Maybe he gets a shot to maybe be like a depth piece, maybe like a, a special teams guy, something like that. And, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like all the XFL guys, if they can just latch on to like a practice squad or like be like the end of the roster type of guy – just like just just uh, get a shot would be uh, great just because yeah these are guys that wanted to be in the NFL and through the XFL have done what they've done in there so um yeah i think that uh not just us but all 32 teams are definitely keeping an eye on the XFL even maybe in the U- in the USFL as well for guys that uh are those kind of like sneaky just out of nowhere guys that come can make it to the NFL and, and uh, accomplish something yeah, and why wouldn't you, Colonel, like throw spaghettis at the wall, bring in bodies in, especially because the XFL offers you the the film. You know that they're in football shape. You know that they're invested, yeah. motivated to come play football. So obviously the, the USF, that's a really good position for an NFL team to feel comfortable with what they're bringing in. They know it. They're more mature. They're bringing in somebody that can help. With Farrar Gardner, I think it's going to be a little bit difficult, but I think special teams is probably the best bet for him just based on what we do have here at linebacker and what they do decide going forward. Jamin Davis's injury is probably nothing, but it is concerning because what we saw last year in OTAs and this other stuff, Andrew Norwell, Trey Turner, and them were dinged up, and we saw what happened throughout the season. So it is concerning, but it's not It's not something you want to go crazy about. And then with with Fra- um, with – Jared Jones I do think he is a very good he's in a good position to make the team because if there's any position that is a big question mark it is the tackle especially long term and short term and so I think that that's a really good spot for somebody he could impress and being able to take the job from Lucas or somebody else and look I I love these types of stories I'm rooting for the guy to be able to make an impact and make this football team you always love those types of storylines but Paul before we go any further Obviously, big news was that Montez Sweat, Chase Young, and uh, Leno are not at OTAs, which are voluntary. But we do have to give them credit for the fact they did show up for workouts in mid-April before the draft, which was the first week. I want to get your opinion on those guys not coming to OTAs because there's been a lot said on the social media sphere and the, and the Twitterverse. Uh, what are your feelings on it? Yeah. Uh, to me, yeah. Uh... Obviously, the the big name and everyone's kind of just pointing the fingers and the barrels at Chase Young for this. Like Charles Leno missing it, I'm not that worried about it because I don't think he's missed a snap or missed a game for us as far as since we signed him here. So, and that's a guy that I think knows the system somewhat, just from uh, certain people or from Matt Nagy, obviously being in uh, Chicago. So, I think he knows the system a little bit already. So, him missing OTAs right now, I'm kind of like, yeah, whatever. He's the Iron Man for us. Montez Sweat, uh, I get it where he's coming from just because uh, he's in a contract year. You don't want to go out and possibly injure yourself and set yourself up for not that big payday that you want to get. And I'm pretty sure he'll be there for the volu- – well, obviously everyone got to be there for the voluntary stuff. But right. uh, I feel like before the mandatory the, – the voluntary stuff is over, I feel like he might make an appearance, him and Chase. But, yeah, as far as Chase goes, because like I said, he's the big name and everyone's kind of pointing the barrels at right now. To me personally, I'm not going to say it's like that big a deal, but it is kind of disappointing from the fact that, like Logan said, they kind of, Ron Rivera in the front office kind of said that they wanted to see him out there during OTAs with the team and all the guys. And like, if you're supposed to be a captain of the team, even though he was a co-captain, he wasn't like the first captain, co-captain of the team, kind of like the face of the team, face of the locker room, 
kind of face the potential face of the franchise type of guy. Mm-hmm. I feel like he would want to be there and just even if even if you're just like doing what Cam Curl does, where you're just showing face, but then you're sitting out the team stuff. But maybe you're doing some individuals or vice versa. So, and again, uh, Chase is trying to get paid as well. So, and if you think back to what Ron Rivera said about just following what Deron did, and he set the blueprint, and even going back in the early in the off season, he was saying that like he, he wants to see Chase there, and like those are the things that get guys paid. And obviously, you got to go produce on the field. But at the end of the day, I get it. And if you like Logan says, you go out there and get twelve plus sacks, fourteen plus sacks. You have like a rookie, you get forced fumbles, you'd score a touchdown or two. No one's gonna remember anything that happened in early May or late May, early June. So for me, it's not a big deal, but it is I'm just a little bit disappointed because I, just like a lot of people, have been showing their frustrations in this situation. I want Chase to be great. I want him to be that game wrecker, that defensive player of the year potential type of guy that everyone said that he was gonna be coming out of Ohio State and it showed the potential flashes here and there. I just wanted him to be there with the guys, kind of just putting in the work and getting ready for the season. But at the end of the day, like I said, if he comes out, balls out, double-digit sacks, game-changing plays throughout the season, it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah, and this is like a life thing. I talked in spaces earlier, and it's almost like reminiscent of if my wife were to tell me not to get her anything for Valentine's Day. Right. If I go in and listen to her, there might be a little bit of an attitude there when it comes to it, because she'll be disappointed, even though she told me that it would have been nice to know that you care, especially on a day. Yeah, right. Exactly exactly how it goes. And and this is what it's like with kind of with Chase Young, where it's like you can't really be disappointed in him, but you are because the thought is what counts, the care that you want to be involved, that you want to be around here. And you brought up Cam Curl, which is a great example. He's fighting for a contract. And I, I, this has a lot of correlation and parallels to just life in general. Like somebody, Chase Young, a first-round pick, knowing that he doesn't have to come in here to be able to produce and do really well. Whereas someone like Cameron Curl, who's fighting for a contract just like Chase Young is, as a seventh-round pick, probably is not comfortable with where he is and wants to ensure that he does get a contract, and that's why he is in the building. And it's just the two difference of philosophies. But that's really where it comes down to with Chase is it's not really a mad at him. You understand it because look at Armani Rogers just got yep. tore his Achilles, right? And now that was just from practice. So can you really go against Chase Young and Montez and Leno and say, it's stupid that you're not there? No, but at the same time, like, could you be there and just talk to the guys, meet the guys, help the younger guys? Because the one thing about Chase Young is the reason why Chase Young is more polarizing than Montez Sweat or, or Charles Leno is specifically because of the leadership of Chase Young. Like, when you were in school, there was some He's kids, always front and center. Yeah, like, when, he always, was, yeah. When you were in school, like, there was always some kid that was just, like, you know, everyone vibed to. Like, whenever he says everyone loved it, everyone party with him. Like, like, if your parents are like, why would that person saying something get to you? And you'd say, well, it's not just him. It's just like he's a popular person. And that's where it is with Chase Young because you know what his impact is to the other players on the team. You know that he's coming in here and the other guys are happy to see him, happy to be around him and the kind of energy that he brings. And that's why it's more disappointing than Montes where the other guys, just because of the leadership and the what he does as a player and the energy that he brings. You would love to have that there. He's like Eric Bieniemy defensively at, from an energy standpoint. And that's why you'd want him there. But you understand it because I'm not an NFL player. I don't have millions of dollars at stake here. I don't know what I would do in that situation, but I can guarantee you, I would be there, without a doubt. Now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Jamal Forrest from the Trap or Dive podcast. What's up, Maul? How you doing, man? Hey, look, I'm I'm all right, man. Things things are pretty good on my side. What's going on, fellas? Kyle, Mike, how y'all feeling? We're doing great, man. OTAs good, man. Are here. Good. You know, it's another chaotic day uh, here as a Washington fan, but is we, it? We would want nothing else, you know. We you live know? in the chaos. We're we're used to it by now. Yeah, I was about to say, you can tell by my response. I was like, this seems like a pretty normal day to me. <laughs> <laughs> One day we'll get peace. And we don't even know what to do with peace once we get it. Uh, I swear. I'm looking forward to it. My man. I... Hey, Jamal, I wanted to ask you, because I've asked this question to others, but I cover your opinion more than uh, more, most, because you do a lot of film breakdowns. You go in, you dissect, you look, and you also interview and pick the brains from other people. So I want to get your opinion on who will get the most snaps this season from the rookie class. Let's X out Emmanuel Forbes, because I think that might be easy. 
Um, I mean, that's a good question. I can, if I kind of, so I think it'll probably be between um, the second and third round pick, uh, Stromberg or mm. uh, what's the guy's name? Quan. I, I don't know why. I still don't know to this day why why his nickname is Quan when his name is Arcadius. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, but um, I, I got to get used to start saying Quan. Um, so yeah, I his can, nickname should be like Frank or something. You know, yeah, Look, I, I don't random. know something more similar to his name, please. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if I had to guess, it'd probably be those, somebody between those two. Um, reason being, uh, Quan is in a position where, like, when you're when you're drafted in the second round, uh, but you're you're drafted for a specific role that has been lacking in Washington for I would say about two or three years now. Like from a from a consistency standpoint, like you got the bodies to put people there. Danny Johnson has been in a slot guy um and and when he had to be um benjamin st juice started out with this staff in this slot um in 2022 until they realized that he was better outside uh but they only found that out when william uh william jackson got hurt yeah. so so they put him out there um and then obviously Ken, uh, kendall fuller had his opportunities in the slot too but i think the thing about Quan and, and what makes him an, an interesting candidate for the most steps out of his rookie class is just understanding like how he can how explosive he is but also like his versatility um being able to play in the nickel but also being able to play uh as a post safety as a single high safety so um that's what be interesting i think he's the candidate and then obviously stromberg um i honestly think that after watching him um i like what he can do he's a young <laughs> athlete like a, a actual athletic interior offensive lineman, a, a good center who uh, is, is really good in the run game. He's a smart player, smart in the sense of like knowing how to get to certain angles, but also like consistently uh, being able to attack that second level. Um, I called him a playmaker and like <laughs> I've only started, I've really fully started taking film seriously last year, early last year. And uh, out of all the offensive linemen that I've, I've looked at in, in, Writ, uh, wrote about like that was the first time I ever used the word playmaker for offensive lineman. Um, but like he, it literally is the case, and I and I guess you can you can make the argument for certain certain type of lineman like the way he can uh, get his hands on uh, the 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 crashers like the last second people declaring to the to the first level of the defense and, and clearing the space for the running back and 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 hoping that the running back finds that lane and and, and nine times out of ten in Arkansas uh, they they did just that him the, the running back and the quarterback. Um, but, but also being able to have the foot speed and space to kind of, uh, create or, or bring some, uh, some athletic features that this interior offensive line last year didn't have. So, um, and then on top of that, again, like I said, he's smart from a, uh, an angle standpoint and, and knowing how to block, but also smart from a pass protection call. Like you saw that a lot in Arkansas, like he was the person who set the protections and things like that. So when you look at Quan and you look at Ricky, Ricky's going to have a, a battle with Nick Gates, obviously. Um, and he, I, I'm sure that Nick Gates is going to have the upper hand on him. But if he shows in preseason, uh, Ricky does, and in training camp, that, you know, he's he's probably better off as the starting center and they can maybe maneuver around with, with the guards, um, then I can see Ricky being being that, that second guy uh, to take over in terms of a snap count or maybe even being the lead candidate in terms of like a – uh, a snap count, maybe even a starter, like a full-time starter, or at least like 12, 13 games or something like that. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But yeah, those two. That's a great way to put it because obviously McCain leaving last season, nobody really there in front of Quan at the nickel spot, but Stromberg does have Gates in front of him, to your point. Great way to put that. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. So um, you've seen what – EB did obviously like they didn't really add any major pieces to the offensive or to the offense this year outside of like a couple linemen in the draft some uh, some guys in free agency that we just mentioned that you just mentioned. Um, do you think that the swapping out EB for Scott Turner and swapping out Sam Howe for Heineke Wentz combination is going to be enough of an upgrade for Washington to have a, su a successful season? And kind of just to like kind of piggyback off that in your eyes, what would be a successful season offensive wise for Washington? Um, so for, for the enemy to answer his first, I, I think that, um, 
comparatively speaking, like it's it's much more uh, lively and and intense, like in a good way, under B Enemy than it was Scott Turner. And, and the reason why, I mean, because I haven't been able to physically attend practices on a consistent basis. Um, but at the same time, like you kind of understood based in um, Turner's demeanor through pressers, but also how yeah. he was described by people who yep. was at practice every day. Like you don't have like an intense individual who is there to correct you, even if you made a, a good play. Like you don't have that person in in, in Scott Turner and uh, Eric Bieniemy is there whether you have a good play, bad play, terrible play, great play to give you feedback on something that needs to be better or something that could be better. And like he'll never let you forget. Um, based on what we're hearing now, and, and obviously the stories at Kansas City, but he'll and even at Minnesota. Um, when he was coaching with Adrian Peterson, I'll never forget that clip. Yeah. But like you'll you'll yeah. never you'll never not hear something from the enemy in terms of like uh, a, a, an offense that's slow slow coming out of the huddle, an, an offense that's lacking in detail, maybe with um, setting protections or, or or maybe even uh, your footwork, or maybe even uh, a mistake that you made and and you thought the play was over, like Sam Howe who threw an interception and, and forgot to go go chase down the, the, the person who picked the ball off. Right. Like he's going to remind you about those things. And, uh, in all, like the attention to detail is important. And I think, um, uh, for an offense who found a way to stick, uh, to, to shoot themselves in the foot on a yearly basis under Scott Turner, um, that is a, a team who can't get right. First and foremost, when you just put the thing under the umbrella, like they were just on some can't get right stuff. Like never could, <laughs> never could get the ball rolling. Um, and never could really stack games and build and, and become a better offense. But secondly, um, you're looking at a, a team who, like, if you understand the smaller things, uh, you're going to be able to to see the game in a in a completely different lens than what you once seen it before. Mm. And 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 that's why I think that with the offense, um, and it kind of merges into the Sam Howell thing, Mike. Uh, but when you look into the offense and you try to figure out what Sam Howell can be under him it's hard to say what he can be. It's like, it's hard to say uh, if they're going to be better than Wentz and, uh, and, and, and uh, Taylor Heineke. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a fair thing to put on how right now, but I think that the best thing that how has going for him is that he has a very good supporting, supporting staff from uh, supporting cats from his receivers to his running backs. And I like what Cole Turner, uh, what he provides and maybe he can play a full 17 and be around but when you have a good supporting cast we'll see what the offensive line looks like it's the reason why i didn't bring them up but um when you have a good supporting cast <laughs> like you kind of understand that the enemy is going to make sure that everybody is in the best position to stick up for their quarterback make their quarterback look good but also execute exactly what the enemy wants to run um and, and, and what he's saying on the field so um the enemy is is the main thing i can't say much about the quarterback yet but a successful season for washington on the offensive side of the football comes down to being able to to be consistently uh effective in the red zone or or or, or creating more explosive plays last year um, they were ranked about, 24th in the nfl in red zone conversion rate jamal 51 percent clip yeah it wasn't it wasn't good and like you think about like that that giants game at home where they couldn't i mean obviously yes we know curtis samuel was pi but before that um terry mclaurin had a, a discrepancy with the ref that was questionable yep. but they had like four or five tries to get in the end zone like yeah. it, it shouldn't have, it sh- like it shouldn't have come down to some of the, some of those plays right um and, and that may be even a bad example because it the refs literally did play a factor but you kind of understand my point yeah. like they're, they're just settling for too much for field goals so mm-hmm. um it's not going to be a sam howe thing obviously quarterback is the biggest the biggest and most important thing i think that sam howe is a good young prospect um, and I'm and I'm very excited for him, but I think the enemy is going to have the biggest job ahead. Um, and I think that this offense is going to be able to uh, take take on the task of of really understanding what he wants out of us, how does out of his offense, um, the different things that he can bring to the table, um, and 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 modernize this offense. Uh, something that Scott Turner really couldn't do and struggled to do. Um, so that's kind of kind of where I'm at. Successful is is bringing more points to the board, being explosive, but also um understanding the details like the very uh small minor details that makes this game uh so so much important 
Yeah, and that three that three worded phrase you used, attention to detail, something that has been said to describe Andy Reid, that's something that's been said to describe Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay. Yeah. So Eric Bieniemy yeah. is in great great position there. But Maul, to wrap this up, I have a couple more questions for you. You had just talked about the quarterbacks. And Washington knows that we have had a carousel of quarterbacks for the past four or five years. Nothing new to us. Uh, You can even go back to 20, 30 years if you really wanted to. But what would you say the over-under, what would you set it to in games played for Jacoby Brissett? Ooh. I'm sorry to do this. Man, nah, I I like this. I like this. Um, And it's, the good thing is that, I mean, well, to be honest with you, I think we kind of knew this to this point, but um, Sam is getting the number one reps. Um, so they're they're taking this give him every opportunity thing seriously right now. So that's good. It is May. So we'll see in training camp like how the, the, the reps are kind of split up. But to answer your question directly, if I, if I were to set the over under, it would probably be at um, maybe two and a half, two and a half games. Um, and that may seem low, I guess, in the grand scheme of things. The, the but... only reason, because I thought you would take the safe route and pick like eight, just like half of them, just to like cover your ass, you know. But I love <laughs> nah. that you went two and a half because that's probably right. Yeah, two and a half, and and because I, I think the thing is, um, if actually it's two ways to look at it. So I think the the main thing is if Jacoby plays any games at all, it's either an injury or Sam Howe isn't playing good. Neither one of those are good. Um, and sure, like if you get hurt, you can be playing good before you got hurt. But um, I, I don't know like when he gets hurt, but also I don't know like what type of injury. I don't even want to think down that that path. No, no. But there's only two possible <laughs> outcomes. Like if he if he comes in and it's either Sam Howe wasn't playing good or or he's hurt. But I think the the biggest thing to focus on is like if Sam Howe isn't playing good. Um, and that's kind of where I guess the the nature of this question probably comes in. It's probably performance based more than it is health based. And, and I think when you when you look at uh, this situation altogether, um, if Sam Howell was was good enough to beat out Jacoby Brissett, and again he has to come in, it's probably already a long season for 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 Ron Rivera. Like you understood what he did last year um, when he he had to. Well, he was conveniently able to move on from Carson Wentz because he got hurt, but he was going to bench him. Like he wasn't playing he was good. Going to, and right. and I don't know if he would have benched him the following week because like it was his decision, as we all know, after that presser uh, <laughs> against Chicago to to I've bring Carson Wentz. Papers exactly. Like <laughs> we all we all knew who decision it was. So who knows if he would have got benched immediately after that Chicago game if he if he didn't get hurt? But it you you it was clear as day like. He didn't want to. He wanted to hang on to Carson as long as he could, and we knew that because when Taylor, um, I think Taylor got benched against the San Fran team, and they ultimately put Carson Wentz back in there. Uh, that's the first thing when he was healthy, and then the second thing is they started Carson Wentz against the Browns. Like that carousel, and not even giving Sam Howell a chance. That's another story. But that carousel shows you like you're you're not in a good position, and you don't want to be in that same spot this year, right. knowing that. Sam Howe uh, won, won the job to start week one, but then you have Jacoby Brissett and you're flip-flopping back and forth between quarterbacks. That's a that's a team and that's a head coach who clearly knows that the answer isn't on his roster, but he's doing the best he can to keep this to keep this ship afloat for a playoff bid. Absolutely. Fantastic. Great job, Jamal. Great. <laughs> last question I have for you. Um, AG, yeah. um, he was somewhat injured last season. We saw him in a walking boot getting onto the team plane, but he was still playing throughout the season. He looks a little bit different this year, along with Brian Robinson. Looked like they slimmed down. But what is your prediction for how Eric Bieniemy is going to use Antonio Gibson? And do you think this could be kind of a surprise year for Antonio Gibson? Um, let's go. Let's start from back to front. Uh, I don't know if it'll be a surprise year. Um, I think the thing is, like, if we if we listen to not even listen, if we just watch Antonio Gibson, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I think he's a world beater. Um, and also don't think he's the most explosive player. Um, and, and I say that because like on, in the past game, like his biggest, his biggest, his biggest play ever in the NFL was 70 something yards. Right. Right. Um, and that was in a screen, that was a screen pass against Buffalo. 
But if you look at like his runs, his rushes, like that's that's one way where you look at him and you understand that he's not fully developed as a running back yet. Yep. Um, and that's from several different like games or or excuse me traits that he that he's lacking in. But he's not a bad running back. He's just sometimes his vision gets in the way. Sometimes he's not the, the most patient runner. Um, and that kind of hurts him. So when you say um, surprise season, I don't think it's a surprise season. I think his usage will be kind of more diverse than what it is now. And um, I, I look at Jarek McKinnon, right? Mm -hmm. I'm actually put a, 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 um, a, a article on Hogs Haven where I kind of just, I just looked at some some ways in how some of his players, Eric Bieniemy's players were used in Kansas City last year. It wasn't like a, a true deep dive in, on a week by week thing, but mm -hmm. Jared McKinnon is one player who I think about when it comes to Antonio Gibson because um, the way they use them from the motions to the screen setups to the blocking protections uh, or or what looks like blocking protections and how they were able to manipulate um, the the aggressive pass rushers to to get McKinnon the ball quickly um, on with blockers in space to to give him some some well designed runs or or even some some different looks where uh, play action wasn't was a was a big deal. Like it's just kind of how they dress things up using Jarek McKinnon, who is not an, an elite player, but he's an effective player and he can make people miss in space. And I think if you can get those type of carries or those type of touches for an Antonio Gibson, and that's just the running back spot. Like you can expound this on to some other players on the position. I mean, on the team like Curtis Samuel and, and even uh, um Casimir Allen, if he can yeah. make the team. Uh, there's there's different ways to to use some of these quicker guys, um, and and that's not even talking about John and Terry who can uh, use a lot of uh, exposure in terms of like the way they, the motions were used to create mismatches um, and things like that. So like I I can go down the, the rabbit hole, but yeah, to Antonio Gibson's point, um, it's not going to be a surprise season. It's it's going to be a, a pretty good pretty good season under Eric Bieniemy because of of how uh, his how his role will expand like. From a from the sense in which we've all been waiting for. Mm. I got yep. you. Jamal, I can't thank you enough, man. I always do appreciate your time to come on here. I call you the intellectual for a reason. You spend a lot of time doing these film breakdowns, dude. I know you said you've only been doing it a year, but it doesn't seem that way, to be perfectly honest with you. Jamal, before we get out of here, would you like to plug your social media handle, your podcast, and your writing, just in case anybody watching hasn't followed you yet, yet and would like to? Yeah, man, I appreciate it. What's going on, Reed? Appreciate you checking What's that up, man? out. What's up, man? I was about to say... How the little one doing, man? Good, good. Yeah, he's good. being a menace right now. We just moved into a new place. That's why it took me a minute because my laptop, I can't find my webcam. So I was like here trying to set up and all of a sudden enough, my FaceTime camera wasn't turning on and shit. But he's tearing everything up, man. We can't get anything yeah, done. Every single thing. You, you, you just moved in for a part. second. I'm sitting here thinking like Wi-Fi. I said, how you got Wi-Fi set up and you ain't moved, but you on your phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, yeah, makes man. sense. Yeah. We, yeah. We're finally going to get TV tomorrow. Shit. Hey, man, congratulations on a new spot. Um, but fellas, yeah, you can. I appreciate you, Kyle, for for allowing me to come on and Mike and, and Mike and Mike. <laughs> I appreciate y'all let me uh, come on. But you can find me uh, on Twitter at at Let Maul Tell It. Um, I do my my writing at Hogs Haven. You'll find uh, primarily film sessions. Um, I, I kind of do the podcast plug here and there, but um, mainly film sessions is on there. Um, and then obviously the Trapper Dive podcast, you can find that on all podcast platforms and on YouTube as well, man. Appreciate you guys. I appreciate you, Jamal. Yeah, Have a good night, brother. I know you're really busy, man. Keep up the great work, man. I appreciate y'all. Y'all take it easy. Have all a good right. weekend, night Jamal. Night. Great Memorial you, Weekend. All right, everybody. We just spoke with a man, Mr. Jamal Forrest. I always appreciate Jamal because uh, he's, <clears> like, <throat> he's not like you would say like a homer, right? He's not going to go yeah. out and just say exactly just right. like get everyone's attention and everything he's going to give you his honest opinion and i really do respect it now let's wrap up this episode guys by answering our fan questions and i want to go in a rapid fire here we only have a couple more minutes but i want to ask one by one so let's go to our discord chat server for the first one i'm going to say it's most likely going to be from our guy tim towner uh shocker question for the pod i see curl came in for an individual work but sat out team drills but Leno, Sweat, and Young will full no-shows. On a scale of 1, lowest, to 10, what would you say the odds are that Curl is extended this summer before anyone else? Mm, I'm going to say, before anyone else, I'm going to say pretty high. I think that this coaching staff knows how valuable Cam is, 
And I think, I mean, it's just evidence. We talk about it all the time. But it's just evidence by what happened last year when he wasn't in the lineup versus when he was in the lineup. And you just, to see him progress every year, like how can you not, like you got a safe, safety that has the ability to be a legit star in the NFL. I think he's going to get, I think he's going to get re-signed fairly early before both those guys. Yeah, um, I do think, uh, I think the odds are very high for Cam. I do think the other guys have to prove it postseason. I think Cam has already proved it yeah, coming up he doesn't need season. to prove it um right. with leno is kind of a different story obviously in aging but he is a very consistent left tackle right he played all 16 games stayed healthy and that's probably why he's staying away but i do think that cam crow has the best odds to get the best odds to get that contract this season jack del rio going out of nowhere to just bring up cam crow and talk about his leadership you know before last season that's the one thing i said from cam you know you're playing great you're doing a great job you're playing like a first round pick from us as a seventh rounder but I need you to be a leader, you know, be vocal. Have This is your team. This is your defense. You're commanding them. Take control of it. And that's what he did. And that's specifically what Jack Del Rio talked about. When your boss brings you your name up out of nowhere, that's a really good sign. And so, yes, I think the odds are very, very high for Camp Curl. Yeah, I'm with you guys. Um, I'd probably go as far as a 10 because I think that, like you said, yeah, 10. I think that Montez and Chase got are gonna guys that are gonna have to prove it in season, especially when it comes to like a long term deal and the franchise tag. I think that obviously if Montez comes out and balls out, he he'll could get the long term deal after this season's over, or they might franchise tag him to say, hey, let's do it again or something like that. But yeah, it's definitely Cam Curl. He's probably more than likely the next one up. Even Ramon Rivera has gone out of gone on his way. Well, he was asked a question, but. He said that all the contract stuff is kind of on hold until new ownership comes in. And I'm sure that new ownership is going to come in. I know Josh Harris is big into analytics. If you just look at the analytics of Cam Curl, the team's way better when he's out there. So, yep. Now, Hall, to keep this with you, let's go rapid fire one for each. This one is from Yam Starch in our Discord chat. Thank you, Yam. If yeah, not too late, I... if we crash and burn this season, don't make the playoffs, Hall. And all the too early pessimistic take on the team who would you feasibly see becoming not just our new head coach but also free front office members and you can't say eric the he's not a given yeah uh i mean the team's doing horribly i would assume it's because the offense is not really clicking like they wanted to so that would go to towards eric the probably not staying around here but i will go Honestly, just talk off the top of my head as far as a coach goes. I know that Ben Johnson was a, a, a big name that was in this cycle of uh, – well, well, it was supposed to be in this cycle of hirings, but he came out pretty early and said he was going back to Detroit. Like what they were building there, wanted to give it one more year in Detroit. So I don't, And he is a guy that's a young guy, innovative, innovative offense. So uh, I would go Ben Johnson from Detroit, the offensive coordinator up there. Uh, front office uh, – I can't think of like a specific name, but if I had to, I'm gonna just gonna pluck a young, up and coming, successful guy that is highly talked about in the football community from either the Bills, Chiefs, or one of those Eagles. top tier. Nah, I'm good. Top, yeah. top tier type of guys. <laughs> no, I'd rather <laughs> top go tier with, type of teams. I'd rather go with Sean McVay. He's getting the hell out of L.A. Um, let's bring him back home, baby. Now, this next question is from Big Tony Shivers. This big Tony, I'm going to answer this one. Tony asks, if we get picked for hard knocks, who do you think would be really entertaining? I think Tress Way is TV gold, and all pro Revo is both funny and easy to root for. Uh, obviously, I think Eric bien is going to take it over. You can see any, he, he is publicity. He is TV. That's exactly what you want to look for. But if Chase Young, I think it is Chase Young. He has that personality. He will take things over. It being a prove-it year for him, I could definitely see that being a big storyline for Hard Knocks if they are here. So Chase Young or Eric bien is probably too easy to do. And everyone loves Tressway. I think it's too easy for that. Tressway is just a fantastic human. But that's a, that's a great pull by you, sir. This next question is from Tim Towner Reed. What do you think of the new NFL kickoff rule? Do you love it? Hate it? Matt? I thought, I thought you were going to ask the other, some of the other questions Tim was asking in the Discord. Yes. Earlier. I thought I was going to have to explain you, some things. So from inter <laughs> in an interpretive dance, you have to explain to Tim Towner what a cream pie is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, it's funny because we were talking about Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> That's just how it came up. But long story. Anyway, uh, another, how do I feel? About another day in the Discord, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I feel about the new kickoff rules? 
And it's new rules are always weird to get used to. I'm still getting used to the number rule where wide receivers and stuff are wearing low digits and all that. And it, and defenders and stuff. And it is, I'm used to it now. I like it. I think it's badass. Like when Jahan Dotson wears one, but this rule, this is, this is going to be a little weird to get used to. And I mean, eventually that's all Andy Reid say what everybody's been stressing. Eventually it's going to be two hand touch, but Hey, it, you know, it's going to be weird, but uh, it'll be all right. And if it doesn't work out at all, then I, I think I'll end up changing it back. Honestly. Yeah. It's completely just taking out kick returners completely. Yeah. Now this next it's question, dumb. Reed, if you can answer this one from Chris Comerton, uh, because we Hull and I have already talked about this subject. His question. Yeah, is, yeah. 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 Everyone's saying chase is skipping voluntary OTAs because we didn't pick up his option and, or doesn't want to, to risk getting hurt on a contract year, but he's already skipped these and worked out on his own. What's your opinion? Yeah, I feel, I mean, that's, this is literally just chase. This is what he does every year. Um, it is a disappointing year. Cause I think a lot of us were expecting him to kind of want to take on a bigger role. Cause it was, it seemed like he was kind of getting, uh, even though the guy hasn't done anything wrong, it seemed like he was kind of getting a bad rap with some of the fan base and with some people in the media for really, I mean, it's unwarranted. I mean, the dude misses OTAs is what it is it's okay it's not the end of the world but would i like him to be here for sure of course i, I mean I, I think that he could it would be very valuable to him but i think it's just a big deal because it's this time of year it just it always seems to happen i think people are disappointed but they'll get over it they'll be fine absolutely now listen this next question is from twitter this is from 800 blue thank you sir which players missing phase three of otas could benefit more by being there charles leno chase young or montez sweat for me personally i think it's charles leno it being a new offense, a new aggressive tone, we talked about earlier how if your boss brings up your name out of nowhere, that means you're doing a really good thing. But you can't get on your boss's mind if you're not there and if you're not being involved. That being said, also last season he was a captain. Coming to a new offense, kind of being that veteran to kind of guide everybody. I understand the argument of he already knows this system, kind of from Matt Nagy, did really well in the workouts in mid-April, um, and so now he's just kind of chilling. Doesn't need to be there for voluntary because he's an older guy, vet guy. Um, but that, but being said, with Eric Bieniemy, I would imagine that showing up is a very big deal for Eric Bieniemy, especially this new kind of system where he's harping on the guys just to get out of the huddle, and Leno isn't up to speed on that. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. I'm not sh exactly sure, but that's one of those minute detail kind of things why Eric Bainey would like you there. And so I feel like out of anybody, I feel like Leno it's probably doesn't have as much pull as the other two do with the defensive staff. You know what I mean? I think Jack Del Rio loves Chase Young and Montez, and so it'd be kind of different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now this next question is from Twitter. Hercules Hall, in reference to Armani Rogers' injury, what position would get weaker if a starting player got injured in training camp? Ooh, ooh. That's uh, a good one. It is a good one. I would say offensive line just because you bring in some new pieces to the line to mix them with the guys that have been here for a little bit, like Leno and uh Sam Cosme. And we don't we have a we have some depth like on the line, but it's a lot of young guys that are unproven. You don't know what uh, a lot of rookies that we just drafted and some un unproven guys that you don't know what you're gonna get if you throw them into the light in the spotlight, like a Chris Paul who had some ups and downs during that Dallas game when he got his start. So I like the cornerback position, running back. You could make an argument for, but I would go with the offensive line. Now, I can understand, like, just to based off what Maya was talking about with Leno, I could also understand if the coaching staff told him, like, don't come because we want to give City Charles and others as many snaps as possible so we can actually see what they have because we know what you have. So that plausible yeah. deniability is always there for um, Charles Leno. Now, this next question. Real, 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 real fast, imagine if Jamin Davis got hurt too, though. Yeah, 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 on the linebacker unit, that that'd be a huge. Well, he huge. is dinged up right now, but Coach Rivera said it's not yeah. that big of a deal. But yeah, to, yeah, your, it's not, to your point, right. that is a big problem. If, if it was it like a serious happen. injury, yeah. Because that's the one thing Jamin has done is he stayed healthy while everyone yeah. is yelling about his play. Now this and last he's got a question. sick hairline. His hairline's like down to where <laughs> my bill, I had it. <laughs> So this question from UK Commanders Alid on Twitter. Thank you, Alid. Appreciate it, brother. Oi! Question for the pod. In soccer, there's one on-field captain. If the NFL was the same, who and why would you pick to lead the Commanders onto the field every week? For me, it would be John Allen for his all-around play and excellent way he talks with the media. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna go John Allen too, but uh, just to be a little different, the other. Other person that you could really see just because he's gaining so much respect around the league has got to be Terry. Uh, I mean, just with what he means to this organization, uh, I think you, you'd have to use him. But I think John Allen's the best answer in terms of like that's like the leader, legitimate leader of this team. I got you. Who would you say, Hall? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say Terry, but 
I would say Cam Curl just because I feel like he's a guy that he doesn't really get that respect like throughout the league because he's not like well known throughout the league outside of Washington. But if you're a Washington fan, if you're in this market or if you're a fan of an NFC East team, you know who Cam Curl is and what he brings to the field. You know how much guys respect him in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you said on Twitter, like he was came in as a seventh round guy, was kind of shy, just kind of doing his thing to a guy that's up for a contract that's the leader of this team and one of the top safeties in the league, a guy that they drafted and developed. And you always got to have a uh, show love to those show love to guys like that. All right. Just give me, give me a little bit here, but for me, Alad, the person that would be the on field one captain, I'm going to explain it, but it's Sam Howell. This football team from a national perspective, I thought looks, you were going to say major Tuddy. Uh, looks at this. We look, choosing heads. <laughs> <laughs> we got heads. And so uh, with Sam Howell, I think that, this team is looked at from a national perspective as kind of being like the younger brother, not taken seriously. They're not going to do anything. Fourth place in the division, they're nobody. Sam Howell is looked at in the same breath nationally. Fifth round pick, doesn't know all that much. This is their opportunity this season to really make some noise, And as it is Sam Howell's. This is Sam Howell's team. This is his pedestal. This is what he has. He's the one person you put on that field because he does represent what this team overall is in their image and how they're looked at. Because if you want to really see how they're viewed, look at how the national media is looking at Sam Howell and his team. He's an exact extension of how they're viewed. So for me, it's Sam Howell. So they go out there and they can really see yeah. what's going to happen to him. Oh, boy, defer to halftime. That's what he'd say. He'd be like, hell the yeah. Rolling boys. Yeah, them old boys defer. Hell yeah, <laughs> Sam, that's sick. Hell yeah. All right, everybody. That's that. going to wrap us up for this episode. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate all you guys. If you haven't yet, please subscribe. And then comment. If you guys would like to submit a question, it's hard for me to see it on the live chat in the comments. So if you can, go on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just search The Burgundy Zone and message us your questions. I could get you for the next episode. I'll put it in there for you. Or if you want to make a video question, like with your phone, just send it uh, to us on Twitter or email, whatever have you. We'll yeah, get that Keep your clothes on for that because uh, there was that one time where Tim Towner you know we were like dude what are you doing <laughs> you know remember that yeah i, I do remember that uh, yeah. but i think that might have been a we, private we message to you can't thank you guys uh, enough. yeah that was i hope Sorry. you guys have a great memorial weekend <laughs> please be safe it's going to be crazy a lot of crazy drivers out please be safe and enjoy the weekend all right everybody i'm kyle let's roll them boys <laughs> and i'm chris hansen why don't you come here and take a seat listen to me <laughs> you've heard that too many times all right everybody watch the football <laughs> Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Woo!